But thank you to the Soil Association for inviting me this evening to give this lecture. Thanks to everyone both in the room and who's joining us online. Peter Melchett was a huge inspiration personally to me, as I know he was to most of you in this room, and indeed far, far further afield than that. And for me, I think he embodied the idea that social and economic and environmental justice are inextricably linked, and that you can't pursue one without the others. One won't be fulfilled, and you won't be successful in pursuing one unless you pursue all three. And throughout his life, it seems to me, and it was just reinforced by what we've just seen, he was constantly making those connections. He was constantly joining up the dots. I think his experience helped shape a strong belief that a society which fails to ensure, for example, that all children are well-fed is a failing society, that a food system which ignores health and nature is a failing food system, and that an economic system that allows profit to be made from trashing the environment is most certainly a failing economy. And my experience uh, in the time that I've been in the UK Parliament has, I think, taught me that inadequate action by successive governments to right these wrongs isn't a consequence of insufficient grasp of the facts. You know, it isn't that they don't understand what needs to be done or that they don't understand the challenges that we face. Rather, I'd argue, I think it's a question of power. It's a question of who has that power, how we get that power back. And thus, it's a question of politics. And as I don't need to tell you here tonight, this whole agenda is just so urgent. Without needing to read the recent authoritative report, The State of Nature, Peter would have been all too aware of the continuing decline in huge numbers of species. With would have known about the poor state of so many habitats in the UK, especially those under agricultural management. But, you know, I suspect even he would have been shocked at the sheer scale of the loss that we're facing right now. Because according to that report, 1,500 species are at risk in Great Britain and a further 281 in Northern Ireland. Amongst them, 43 bird species that were once abundant in our countryside. As farming has grown more dependent on agrochemicals, the distribution of invertebrates beneficial to crop production has shrunk. In 50 years, the distribution of pollinating insects has declined by an average of 18%. And for those insects which are predators of crop pests, including hoverflies or ants, rove and ladybird beetles, the position is even worse. There, we're looking at an average decline in distribution of around 34%. So I think there could be no clearer signposts of the need for change. Nature is in free fall, and the climate is on a precipice. Just this week came news that our remaining carbon budget to limit the climate crisis to 1.5 degrees of global heating is now, in the words of scientists, tiny. Sending what those same scientists have called a dire message about the adequacy of existing climate action. And you really do get the sense now, I think, that scientists are running out of language that is strong enough to wake up the, the politicians to the, the scale and the urgency of the challenge in front of us. And so my proposal to you this evening is that if we're prepared to reimagine the politics that have brought us to this point, if we are able to get that right, then we might just find that everything else follows, that we are then listening to the evidence, that we are automatically connecting the social and the economic and the environmental, and that we are re-establishing the conditions for security and prosperity and fulfillment. As you know, Peter eventually stepped away from party politics, believing that he could deliver more meaningful change from beyond Whitehall and Westminster. But he never stepped away from politics itself. Campaigning for Greenpeace or indeed for the Soil Association, I think for him was simply another way to use public opinion to get politicians both within government and without to listen to a wider range of voices than just their own members. He understood that the state of Britain's politics and the state of Britain's environment were bound tightly together. And frankly, I think if you he were here with us tonight, he would be pretty dismayed by both. But he knew, 
that you can't have a good environment without effective politics. He knew that the businesses that we need for prosperity can only do their part in delivering a high-quality environment for all of us if government creates a strong and consistent policy framework within which those businesses can act. I think we sometimes forget that there are two bits, two parts of government, the administrative bit and the political bit. And I think Peter would have understood that the current collapse in environmental quality in Britain is pretty much a failure of the political part. And he would have detested, as do I, the habit of conservative politicians in this government of blaming civil service, uh, blaming judges, basically blaming anybody except themselves for its inability to deliver on its repeated promise to leave Britain a better environment than it inherited. And I do wonder if there's anyone here tonight who genuinely thinks that that promise will be fulfilled. For the benefit of those online, there are no hands going up at this, <laughs> at this point. But he would also have known that a lot of this failure is down to the malign influence of a few divisive politicians and their editorial amplifiers who believe that government itself is the enemy and that we need an awful lot less of it. So I think it is fitting, and I hope it is, that the focus of this lecture tonight is not on policy, with which we are amply blessed, but instead on a reimagining of the pol politics itself, of the political process, so that it's fit to deliver the transformation that this critical moment demands. And I want to explore three ways in which changing politics for the better will change our shared future for the better as well. First, by looking a little bit more about the relationships between power and democracy and politics. Second, by rewriting the political script, and by that I mean integrating long-term thinking and joined-up thinking into the way in which politics is done. And third, by rewiring our political system so that it asks the big questions and doesn't shy away from them. So, to the first of these, power, democracy and politics. And I thought it might be helpful to look at this through the lens of, of our waterways. Because we can't credibly discuss reimagining politics in our times without reflecting on how we came to be standing on the edge of an ecological precipice. And if we needed any evidence of that being the case, then looking at our rivers and our waterways is a pretty good place to start. Because the shocking fact is, as you will know, not a single river in the United Kingdom is free from pollution, a chemical cocktail of sewage and agricultural waste and plastic. None are technically safe to swim in, and only 14% of them reach an acceptable ecological standard. And as we're all discovering, this is a scandalous example of successive ministers and regulators neglecting their responsibilities for years and years, giving away or simply, I don't know, forgetting that they have powers to use were they to choose to do so. Because we know both Ofwat and the Environment Agency have been absent on duty. Ofwat seems to have forgotten that the water company's license requires them not to pay a dividend if it would impair their ability to invest. Well, there's certainly been a failure to invest, but no failure to pay those dividends, a tidy £1.4 billion last year. You know, didn't they notice this? The Environment Agency has enforcement powers which could have compelled the water companies to invest. Yet even just today, we learn that water use um, uh, inspections have been slashed by almost half in the last five years. So what were they doing? Well, the CEOs and boards of these public regulators are appointed by ministers. And if they fail in their duties, it is well within the power of ministers to find talented and experienced people who will replace them. Peter would have well understood that their failure to do so was no accident. Because, you know, if a government doesn't want to do what's needed to solve a problem, it's probably better that it fails to discover that there's a problem there in the first place. I don't mean to sound cynical, but the pattern of massive underinvestment and the stealthy weakening of the effectiveness of our institutions that are designed to protect the environment seems, to me at least, not to be happening by chance. Whilst companies like Thames Water and, in my own region, Southern Water, have been fined record amounts for dumping sewage in our waterway waterways, they appear to have made 
a short-term calculation that it's more effective to pay up than to meet the infrastructure and operational costs of upgrading our Victorian age sewage systems. And as I say, this hasn't happened by accident. Our politics has enabled this to happen, transferring power from the state, acting in our common interest, in this case to corporations acting for shareholders. And the state of our rivers and water supply are just the tip of the iceberg. And in his book, The Plunder of the Commons, the economist Professor Guy Standing details how huge swathes of our commons have been sold by governments to private entities without any kind of democratic process, without compensation, certainly, and without our permission. And that issue of permission, I think, matters because it speaks to where power should lie if our politics were working better, and that is with citizens, not with corporations. Creating a better balance relies on a functioning democracy, and I think Peter would have been as alarmed as I am by the decline in public confidence in democracy, not just elsewhere in the world, but right here at home. So I want to pick out just one of the very many reasons why, without democracy, we can't hope to deal with the climate emergency or to deal with biodiversity loss or with the accumulation of persistent toxins and all of the rest of the issues that we have to address with urgency to maintain the environmental conditions necessary for, for life and for prosperity. And that reason that I want to pick on in particular is that it's to do with the ability to correct mistakes, to change course in more or less real time. And I say that because I think we should be very clear that there will be no mistake-free path to a zero-carbon future in which we prevent ecological collapse. But when we make those mistakes, as we surely will, we have to be able to correct them quickly. And that means we need to strengthen the machinery on which our democracy depends, not weaken it. And that is the machinery, let's not forget, which autocrats tend to want to destroy in order to hold on to power, and it includes things like a politically independent civil service and judiciary, a vibrant civil society with the rights to organize and to protest, academic and press freedom, and an unpoliticized set of public services. This is the machinery that societies have developed to help them learn from their mistakes. And without it, frankly, states make problems worse, not better. But it won't have escaped, I'm sure, the notice of many of you that all of these have been under attack by this government. I think that what we need to do is to develop a learning state, by which I mean one that is genuinely democratically accountable by all of those different bodies that I've just outlined, one that upholds the rule of law and by implication, one that upholds as well social cohesion. And I am quite sure that Peter would have shared my anxiety at the arrival of a British government, no less a conservative British government, that is so very casual about its commitment to the rule of law. So talking further about democracy, I, I would be the first to accept that democratic solutions to any problem are often untidy, they are often incomplete, they are often messy, and they rarely please everyone. But there are tools that we could be using that I think would improve our experience of that democratic process. And one of those would be citizens' assemblies, because they have proven time and again that participative democracy is a vital way of bringing people together and of reaching agreement. Because we know that a transition to a livable future is not something that should be done to people, it's something that should be done with people, and only then can we hope to have a genuinely just transition? And we've got wonderful evidence of these citizens' assemblies in practice. Initiatives like the Climate Assembly UK shows that people have a huge appetite to be part of identifying and agreeing positive solutions. And I note that assembly members time and again come up with ideas far bolder than any government such as free bus travel, or a frequent flyer levy, whereby the more times you fly, the more it's going to cost you, or advertising bans on high-emission products. You know, we're often told that people won't get on board with bold policies. But it turns out that when people are given objective information, when they're given the time and the space to deliberate and to discuss and to consider, nothing could be further from the truth. 
I think it's also striking that alongside clear, proactive, accountable and consistent leadership from government, what those assembly members also want is cross-party consensus and for political parties to work together, something that I know the Soil Association is also championing. A better politics for these times also demands a better voting system, a properly proportionate one. And I want to assure you that this isn't just special pleading from a small political party, which would benefit vastly were such a thing to come to pass. But it's also the case, and the evidence shows this, that fairer voting systems renew trust. They give people greater agency. They deliver governments that are more inclined to collaboration. They also increase turnout. They increase engagement, including, crucially, by young people who, like the rest of us, want their votes to count. Now, we know there will be a pivotal election here in Britain within 12 months. And there are many ways in which we can all continue Peter's work and honour his memory, and many of you are doing exactly that here tonight. But I think one of the best ways of all that we can pay tribute to his life of campaigning for the environment is to vote for what you believe in when it comes to that next election. Naturally, I would love it if you all voted for my party, but frankly, it is far more important that you actually get out to vote, and we send out that message particularly to young people, that young people get out to vote and can believe in that political system and believe that they can affect change. And that brings me to my, my second point about this issue of rewriting that political script and incorporating some other principles into it, like the longer-term thinking. In this most critical of climate and nature decades, we know that every and any delay creates dangers. We're all also aware, I think, of the pressures that regular election cycles place on decision-makers to pursue policies that show benefits quickly and the difficulty that that can add to addressing longer-term challenges. Yet the unravelling of the political consensus on climate change by this government is, I think, the worst example I can recall of a British political party and government sacrificing our national interest for perceived electoral advantage. The spate of recent announcements with more promised in next week's King's speech are winding back important green measures. And it follows, of course, the, the by-election in Uxbridge. And no doubt it's designed to enrage Greenpeace and energize the missing Conservative voters. Well, maybe it will succeed in doing that, although, frankly, if you look at the results of the most recent by-elections, then it perhaps suggests that the public at large hasn't been fooled. And it certainly creates some strange allies. I don't think I've ever actually come out before saying that I agreed with the Association of Motor Manufacturers, but I certainly did agree, them, agree with them when they pointed out that Delaying the introduction of electric vehicles makes absolutely no sense, environmentally or economically. Frankly, you have to be doing something spectacularly stupid to make sure that you can get the motor industry and Extinction Rebellion to agree that what you're doing <laughs> is wrong. You might have thought that a Conservative government in, a in particular would be appalled by any waste of scarce resources, especially financial resources, which this rollback absolutely brings in its wake but not this one. Cutting the so-called green crap has cost energy consumers £28 billion since 2010. That is over £2 billion a year every single year. Promising no new energy efficiency regulations will cost consumers almost £1 billion a year every year. And one of the things that made me most angry was hearing Rishi Sunak stand at that dispatch box, dispatch box and try and pretend that his rolling back of the requirement for landlords to properly insulate the homes of tenants was somehow in the interests of the great British public. Failing to secure a contract for new offshore wind could cost consumers £2 billion a year for more expensive electricity from gas. And the health effects of the worst insulated homes in Europe already costs the NHS £1.2 billion a year. And so just in parenthesis, here are a few things that an incoming government even one with no money, could actually do if the will were there. It could start by restoring the energy efficiency task force that the Prime Minister killed. It could designate every building in Britain part of our critical national infrastructure. It could set a target for upgrading the building stock as a whole into a national infrastructure planning policy. It could mandate the UK Infrastructure Bank to develop financial products to crowd in private investment to our leaky building stock. And I can't resist pointing out as well, and I think 
Peter would have appreciated that, that doing all of that would eliminate any need to spend further public money on big or small nuclear power stations, which are in any case, apart from their very many other problems, far too slow and far too expensive to build to meet the current government's 2035 target for carbon-free electricity, let alone Labour's 2030 target. I could go on, but suffice to say, Rishi Sunak's net zero rebrand will make everyone's energy bills higher than they would otherwise have been, which in turn will push up the price of food and travel and fail to generate the true security of renewables and energy efficiency. More damagingly, perhaps, governments that flip-flop on issues this important for transparently short-term reasons deter investors, both domestic and foreign, and they deter them from investing in everything, not just in climate change. So those investors will simply sit on their hands and hope that a different government will come along in due course. That issue of hope is powerful. And I want to think about hope in terms of what that means for our young people in particular, who, in my experience, are hoping with all their hearts for something infinitely better than what today's politics is serving up. Because everyone who is young is inheriting a planet that is in a worse condition than the one that their parents inherited. So giving future generations more of a voice in our political system could deliver another of the power shifts that we def desperately need. And on this, Wales is leading the way. In 2015, the Senate adopted pioneering legislation, the first in the world, to enshrine in law a duty on public bodies to safeguard the well-being of future generations. And so inspired was I by that and by the work of Jane Davidson, to whom I pay warm credit, that I also then presented a private member's bill in Westminster myself that seeks to do the same thing for the UK as a whole, to value future lives and indeed the well-being of current generations in the manner that they deserve. A 2020 landmark report from the World Health Organization, UNICEF and The Lancet, found that no single currently, current country is sufficiently protecting children's health, their environment, and their future. And Peter was way ahead of the curve on this, as usual, because he led the brilliant appeal to reconnect good food production to children's health by the Food for Life scheme, which thrives to this day. Nowadays, we might call it intergenerational injustice. For him, I suspect it was just plain common sense. And it relied on joined-up thinking. And Peter, as a farmer, always understood that food and water, energy and climate security are all intimately linked. Adopt the right public policies, and the pursuit of one of those reinforces the realization of the rest. Treat them separately in silos, and you risk success in one area being bought only at the price of failure in another. What today we might call systems thinking he was practicing and again would have seen as plain common sense. He would also have fully understood that Brexit was always going to be a needless national catastrophe that exacerbates precisely that siloed thinking. As bad for farmers and, as they've now discovered, fishing communities as it has been for the environment and the economy. He might not have been surprised by the failure of this government to plan for the consequences of Brexit for food and agriculture, but like the rest of us, I think he would never have imagined that seven years after gaining exactly what they wished for, this government still has no clear plan for managing the consequences of Brexit. Brexit has been an unpleasant shock to every purse in Britain, and the Ukraine war added another shock to food prices. And we can count on there being many more shocks to come in the intensifying fires and floods and droughts of a changing climate and as those hit food production all across the world. So a new vision of joined-up politics must change the script and go beyond treating agriculture and food and health and nature as if they were all essential but separate areas of policy. Our future food security and its resilience to local and global price shocks needs to be long-term, it needs to be holistic if it is to protect producers and consumers alike. And even in the best of times, all governments are subject to completing priorities and unexpected events which can blow them off course. What we've seen with the Climate Change Committee is that the creation of a public body that has helped successive governments keep a steady course throughout the inevitable short-term buffering and buffeting of events, I think we can see from that 
a really useful model because that is what's given investors and communities and individuals the confidence to plan and invest for the future. And my proposal tonight is that we should build on that experience and create an equivalent statutory committee reporting to Parliament to advise the government of the day on what must be done to build the resilience of our food and agriculture system from all of these myriad shocks which we know are to come. Because we also know that right now, ministers are taking us in the wrong direction. The stealthy relaxation of controls over things like animal protection or food safety or pesticides has been a deliberate, if unheralded, policy of this government. It has been confident that colluding editors wouldn't reveal what this might mean for food exporters to our biggest markets in the EU, and equally certain that no one would notice the harm to the pollinators and invertebrates essential to maintaining the productivity of our farms. But it would only take a tiny amount of cash and a comprehensive refreshing of the boards of relevant regulators to reverse that damage. And I hope you'll forgive me for another quick digression, but I have always been baffled by the inability of most of our political leaders to recognise and mobilise the extraordinary cultural asset we have in Britain's voluntary sector. Over half of our population, at least 35 million people, have volunteered at least once in the last year. Nearly 10 million volunteer at least once a month. We are a nation of gardeners. It will cost very little cash, but perhaps a lot of imagination, for ministers to work with local governments to mobilise individuals and families and communities and a host of public and private bodies to take more control of our own food security and to protect nature at the same time. And there is an initiative out there, and I pay tribute to it by, by the Wildlife Trusts in particular who are managing it, the Coronation Gardens Initiative. And it's showing the way that initiatives for food and for nature. And there are a host of other similarly locally delivered initiatives which is easy to overlook in a world overloaded by too many channels and not enough time. And within that, I also pay tribute to the proposals for a national nature service. I think that has a lot to add as well. But if you take all of those together, I think you understand that tackling the connected problems of climate and food security can't succeed if central government doesn't notice, doesn't engage with, and doesn't reinforce this upswelling of local efforts which have been made possible by today's technology and by today's information flow and connectivity. We have to join all of that up in order to scale it up and to really have impact. And changes like that would help write a different political story and reflect the interconnectedness of social, environmental and economic justice. Further changing the balance of power between citizens and corporations. Now, food systems have troubled societies arguably since, since records began, but certainly since industrialization, creating, representing, and deepening divisions. But these are of nothing as compared to how fundamental the challenges facing, facing our food system are today. And food is the driver of much that blights the future. Water use, land use, labor, unequal diets, squandered resources. It's where economics and social policy and environment collide. And as I said at the start of this lecture, Peter was clear, if we fail to ensure all children are well-fed, we're a failing society. If we ignore the human and environmental health implications of our food system, we're a failing economy. Our politics must be reimagined so it's capable of addressing these multifunctional goals, capable of getting the food politics right. That is, I think, one of the biggest challenges we face today. And one of the things I am sure that Peter would cheer us on to do will be to carry on building those broad alliances, animal welfare alongside farmers, alongside health advocacy, alongside environmental enhancement, alongside consumers, alongside decent jobs. And civil society has a really important role to help bridge single-issue discourses. And the challenge to civil society, I think, is that it needs to be dug out of its own sectional trenches where it can often be quite comfortable to retreat. The food, farming and environmental worlds are alive with inspiring visions on the way forward. Rewilding, regenerative, organic, agroecological, nature-friendly, biodynamic. But while this experimentation is flourishing from below, the UK post-Brexit lacks any clear steer from government. The UK, or more accurately, England, lacks a coherent position on where the common good lies in food systems. And leaving the EU hasn't helped. Ironically, much that the UK pushed for is actually quite high now on agendas in Europe. 
the EU 2020 farm to fork strategy reconnects consumption, health and food production. Although sadly it is under fierce attack from business as usual, big farming interests. The 2019 Green Deal emphasises carbon and jobs. But here in the UK, we have no proper integrated food policy. Shoots are emerging in Wales, although it's disappointing that the Food Wales Bill fell, and in Scotland, where there was the successful Good Food Nation Act. But meanwhile, the 2020 English Agriculture Act, that was supposedly part of the Brexit dividend, barely even mentioned food. We all then waited and waited and wondered what the political take-up of Henry Dimbleby's much-awaited 2021 National Food Strategy would be. And what a disappointment. It was summarily dismissed by Boris Johnson on the day of launch as some kind of nanny state thinking, when in reality it is an awful lot more than that. And then the 2022 government food strategy ostensibly filled the new yawning English policy gap with a 33-page paper that was rightly and widely derided as weak and thin. No major expansion of free school meals, no mention of a 30% reduction in meat and dairy, and no real improvement in animal welfare. We cannot expect food and farming to improve public health and environment unless there is a clarity of vision. And that demands the courage to ask the big questions and look for big solutions, to value ideas and listen to experts. And it demands having a proper debate about the kinds of proposals set out in the Soil Association's excellent publication, The Time Is Now, and I really warmly uh, congratulate you on that document. The same problems I've talked about already tonight are preventing this from happening. Too much power in the hands of those for whom the only thing that matters is making money, not enough power in the hands of those who will be directly affected today and tomorrow, and indeed for many tomorrows to come. A government dismantling the democratic apparatus standing in its way, the short-term mindset, the silo mentality, they've all contributed to the creation of this policy vacuum that urgently needs to be filled. And that brings me to my third and final question. In other words, this question about how do we develop a political system that's designed to ask and debate and answer the big questions. And whilst I know that I open this lecture saying that policy wouldn't be my focus, we land here now because it's not just a valuable outcome of getting the politics right for this age of environmental breakdown. It is a vital one. The crucial challenge when it comes to food for the next government is not only the best use of carrots and sticks, but also the bigger framework of sustainable food systems, the strategic links between consumption and production, and achieving a sense of direction and confidence that's currently lacking. A new compact between farmers, other food producers, and society hasn't been put in place since Brexit, but the need for it couldn't be clearer. In order to realign with the issues of the coming decade, the journey towards net zero emissions, healthier and more sustainable diets, more affordable diets, and the questions we must ask and debate are not contained within national boundaries, of course. Trade policies need to support environmental standards and viable farm businesses in the UK. Yet this government has persisted in pursuing trade deals with countries like Australia, for example, with scant regard for interests of farmers or the environment, sidelining DEFRA in the process, as was openly admitted by the former Secretary of State, George Eustace. And furthermore, trade policy continues to be conducted behind cl closed doors with a disregard for transparency and insultingly little access for any kind of stakeholders. So, Peter's own experience was rich. He knew that what we need is a combination of inside and outside tracks if we're to get change, that we needed all kinds of voices around the table, if we're to be able to develop the new robust laws which provide clear frameworks for good practice, steering us on land use, on food use, on good trading relations within supply chains, not just between nations. And we need an environment in which those ideas flourish, where farmers and growers are really listened to alongside the environmentalists, alongside the young people worried by the lack of jobs in their rural communities, worried about the price of housing, alongside the families who are using food banks, alongside everyone with a stake and a food system that works, and that pretty much means everyone. An environment where we don't play political football with questions like taxing meat or solar farms and house building, but grapple with and interrogate them. The politics of sustainability isn't just about what we do, it's about how we do it. It demands curious, smart and open minds, sadly too rare in today's politics. There's no silver bullet that will make that happen, but alongside the other challenges I've outlined, I think there's a strong case for less tribal politics. As the lone Green MP, I've had little 
choice, but to work across party on everything from voting reform to Brexit to women's rights. And it has underscored for me what I've always held to be true, that no one political party has a monopoly on wisdom. If politics is to rise to the unparalleled challenges we're facing, it must change so that we successfully secure the best policies to safeguard our future. Not only to safeguard and save nature and greenhouse gas emissions, to restore health and water quality, to provide farmers with greater security, not only doing all of that, but really demonstrating to people that they have agency, that they can make a difference, that they can change things, that there is nothing inevitable about the way in which politics is done today. As the Soil Association, Soil Association urges in The Time Is Now, politics must become more cross-party and more collaborative in order to ask the right questions and to develop the best possible answers for all of us. And so, in closing, as a young hered hereditary peer and a very active shadow minister of environment in the Lords until he formally quit party politics, Peter had an early induction into the importance of how diplomacy and politics and regulatory frameworks swirl and work. He was an eternal optimist, and although he seemed a benign figure, and I'm sure he was in many ways, he also knew that there was the need for a certain steeliness to achieve the right conditions to get things done. Today, the fate of nature, and thus of humankind, depends on creating the political conditions for those right outcomes to emerge. I believe that if we can be led by Peter, by his values, understanding and his practical approach, we can pave that way, and we must. For our ability to reimagine politics in an age of environmental breakdown will help determine nothing less than what the future of life looks like on this one fragile and infinitely precious planet. Thank you.